Okay. So <clears throat> I'm Dr. Darren Schmidt, and uh, this is my office. Raise your hand if you've never been in this building before and you're not a pay. Okay, cool. How'd you hear about this lecture? Uh, I drove by. I was interested. Oh, cool. Literally. What a, yeah. Who else? <laughs> okay, cool. All right. So we've been in this building. We opened June 25th, and <clears throat> I had a office right around the corner at the Lib Wag complex, right around the corner. And um, it was moldy. And uh, so that was a fiasco. I was over there 13 years. And it took a year to find this building and seven months to build it out. But the landlord wouldn't do anything about that building. Um, anyways, so in the last three years, three years ago I had this horrible chest pain from the mold. I didn't know it was from the mold. It took a year for me to find the mold. But in the meantime, I had high blood pressure and pounding chest pain going up the jaw, down the arm. Feet were swollen, temperature was down two degrees, no appetite, nausea. I would fall asleep for 60 seconds at my chair, uh, at my desk. Next to the window, that was leaking. That had been leaking for 13 years. I've been in there, th I was in there 13 years. So I went through a series of events to try to figure out why I had these symptoms, and I knew it wasn't placking of the arteries in the heart. And I have a machine to verify that. And um, so what I found out, uh, I found the mechanism of chronic disease. And I also, at the same time, was figuring out ketosis. So ketosis is where your body's burning fat. And when you, when you, so when your body's burning fat, um, <clears throat> that's the native state of the body, okay, a mild state of ketosis. So the word ketosis comes from the three chemicals that are ketone bodies. And when your body's, you know, utilizing those as fuel, then you're in ketosis. So if you're not in ketosis, you can still be burning fat, but you don't get all these tremendous positive health benefits that you get from ketones. Now, then the other option is that you're burning sugar. So every American basically is burning sugar every day of their life, and then they suddenly have a heart attack, and it's a surprise. Or now they get a diagnosis of cancer, and it's a surprise. Or they get diabetes, and it shouldn't be a surprise because you've been eating, you've been burning sugar your whole life. So you gotta get into ketosis and reverse that, mechanism, that, uh, that state. Okay, so when you're burning sugar excessively for a long period of time, you get the mechanism of chronic disease, which is called lactic acidosis, which is what I figured out because of the black mold. And I was reading medical and nutrition textbooks dating back from 1920 through 1960. All the doctors in those years were trying to fix the mechanism of chronic disease. They weren't really looking at the causes of chronic disease, such as uh, excessive sugar intake, uh, mercury poisoning, you know, toxic poisoning of the body. They were just trying to fix the mechanism. It wasn't until the 1980s when mercury was discovered as a cause of chronic disease in the body. Okay, so I'm just giving my history. Um, so, um, so ketosis, I knew about ketosis when I started my practice in 1998. I started in 97, but got into nutrition seminars in 98. And there's a guy named Dr. Michael Dobbins. He's passed away now. He actually died from cancer of the prostate. He was a nu nuclear, or is it nuclear, no, nuclear submarine uh, rate, um, technician, and he got too much radiation. Dr. Bohr, you know Dr. Dobbins, right? Did you ever see him give a lecture? No? Um, and he was in ketosis every day for like 20 years. That didn't stop his cancer. He had the, the radiation was embedded in his prostate and he died from that. But um, as a chiropractor, I'm a chiropractor, the chiropractic field was taught by Dr. Dobbins and other people like him in ketosis, you know, for, for, for a long time, you know, decades. So the state of ketosis is not something new to the chiropractic profession, but I'm telling you, it's super new to the medical profession. And there's a lot of resistance to ketosis. So as I talk about this, I'm going to lead into carnivore eating and ketosis here. So just bear with me. So, um, so there's great research in the last five years on ketosis that didn't exist 30 years ago when Atkins was talking about it. He started talking about it in 1972, so the Atkins diet. 
he was missing some technology, which didn't exist at the time, and he was missing some very important facts, but he still was getting a lot of people well. And um, so now that we have new research, especially in the last five or 10 years, now we have more data and we can apply ketosis, the ketogenic diet, to a lot more people and be accurate and have better uh, benefit to a wider variety of people. Um, so I started, I, I can tell you back in 02, 03, I would tell people eat low carb and then eat as much meat as you need to. Eat as much meat as your body wants. Eat adequate amounts of fat and protein. Those are the words that I used to say in 03. And I even had a book from Dr. Mercola called The No Grain Diet. And people would say, well, how am I supposed to eat low carb? Or how am I supposed to cut out bread? And I would just pick that book up and show them the title, The No Grain Diet. Okay. Um, so, and I got some pushback from some patients. And I was a little bit less forceful back then. But now that I, and I the, you know, not that force is, is that valuable. But the point here is that as I've learned about how to work with the macronutrients, the grams of fat, protein, and carbs. It's more about doing the math right, as opposed to just, okay, eat this, don't eat this. And, I've, and I'm done doing that. I don't tell people what to eat anymore. I used to say, you know, like, well, eat avocados, and then somebody would say, well, I don't like avocados, and I can't do Dr. Schmidt's diet because he wants me to eat avocados, and I don't like avocados. So I just got tired of hearing that. So now I say eat, 100 grams of fat to 50 grams of protein plus carbs, get the protein at 35, get the carbs at 15. You know, and I'm talking about numbers, grams of, of the macronutrients. So, and we use an app on the phone called Chronometer, and you put your food in there, and it gives you the grams of the macronutrients. So there's other apps too, like MyFitnessPal, but that breaks. If you're putting in too much fat, it can't do the math right. And I'm telling you, at the beginning, like three years ago, I was pulling my hair out like, how are people eating this much fat, but they're only eating 1,000 calories in a day? That's because the, the app was wrong. So the, the app called Chronometer works, and it was designed, um, co-designed by Dr. Mer a guy named Dr. Mercola to work for people that are getting into ketosis and, and eating a lot of fat. So, so I've been, and then, so when you do, when you, so ketosis is one thing. It's a goal to achieve, and there's ways to get there, including fasting, and there's different types of fasting. There's intermittent fasting, which means skip breakfast, basically, or maybe just do one meal a day. So you go dinner to dinner to dinner, and those dinners are fantastic and very satisfying. There's block fasting, which would be like five days, for example. Another type of fasting would be an extended fast, so now we're talking three weeks or 30 days. <clears throat> so, and that's more advanced stuff. Um, but a lot of people are just jumping into the intermittent fasting. It's the number one most searched diet on the internet right now. Because how easy is it to just skip breakfast? You know, and you may be hungry at 8 o'clock in the morning or something, but you just work through it. And the only reason why you get hungry at 8 o'clock is because you're, you, you're, you're training your body to do that. You can, there's, a, there's a couple chairs there and there's a couple chairs there. And there's one back in that corner. Okay, so this hormone is called ghrelin, and you train your body to raise up the ghrelin. Let's say if you normally eat three times a day, you train your body to raise up the ghrelin as like, a, as like an alarm clock. And it reminds you, hey, it's time for you to eat. Just like you've been eating every day for the last 10 years, it's now this time, so the ghrelin goes up. And if you just work through it, the ghrelin will go down and your appetite goes away. So you can just skip that meal. So, but yeah, so intermittent fasting, mo for most people, it just means skipping breakfast. But there's one very important key about intermittent fasting and skipping breakfast is that the previous meal has to be awesome. So if, it's, if you're skipping breakfast and now it's 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock or 11, and you're thinking about, oh my gosh, it's, I'm so hungry, I can't wait till noon, and then it's like 11.59 and you're, like, you're ready to sprint to the refrigerator, you're doing it wrong. So that dinner that you had 18 hours earlier has to be really satisfying. So what's the most satisfying food on the planet for most people? Anybody have any idea what the answer is to this? Yeah, red meat. Red meat is the most satisfying. So we can get into, into the history of this going back 13,000 years ago 
which is absolutely fascinating. But there's a few reasons why red meat is so satisfying. And um, so now we're, I'm, I'm going to use this term species specific diet. Okay, so the human species, there's a specific diet that our bodies, our DNA evolved on. And red meat is part of that. So red meat has um, several factors in it that make it very satisfying and make you happy when you eat it. So one of the nutrients is um, myoglobin. And you've heard of hemoglobin, which is iron and oxygen in the blood. Myoglobin is iron and oxygen in the muscles. So it feeds your muscles. Red meat feeds your muscles better than chicken and fish and other sort of white meat, pork, if you, if you will. Uh, red meat includes lamb and goat and beef. And then, of course, gyro meat, which is lamb and beef combined, which is like, how much better can you get <laughs> than gyro meat? Um, so there's also carnitine in, in red meat. So let me sort of back up before I explain a little bit about carnitine. Now, in, so throughout the last three years, I've been talking to patients about the, uh, the ratio of fat grams. This is again from chronometer compared to protein plus carbs. And if you, if you achieve a ratio of two to one, you'll be in ketosis. For a lot of people, this is at least moderate ketosis. It could be heavy ketosis. If you're at a one-to-one -one ratio, that's more mild ketosis, or maybe you're just out of ketosis. <coughs> and the key, the, when I say ketosis, it's measured by blood. All right, and I'm not going to get into measuring ketones by blood and the math behind all that stuff. But um, the standard American diet is one to four. So very high with the carbs. That's the problem here. And when you do this every day, your body never even touches the fat. That's why cholesterol goes up. Your body never processes the fat because it's trying to bring this down in the blood. So, that's, so people get high triglycerides, high cholesterol, high LDL, and the doctors freak out and they want to put you on a statin drug when what they should do is just have you eat this way. Okay, so um, now one thing that's, so I started eating more of the carnivore diet about two and a half, three months ago, and it was a Tuesday night. I had a, a calorie deficient uh, dinner, and I woke up Wednesday morning and I was really hungry, and I said, this is the day I'm starting the carnivore diet. And I had a pound of red meat for breakfast. I had four, four per, uh, and I had it just, you know, like a pound, like thawed in the refrigerator. Made four patties out of it. I ate it. For lunch, I had two patties. For dinner, I had one. So I had almost two pounds for the day. And by the end of the day, I felt absolutely fantastic. And I slept like a baby. Like I, and my sleep is good, but I slept better that night than I had in as long as I can remember, eight, 10 years maybe. So I slept really, really well. Three days later, okay, now I had mentioned I had the black mold poisoning in my lungs and heart. I had always, because of that, I had a weakness in my, along, the back, along my spine, in the front of my spine back here. I felt weak. Three days later, that was totally gone because of the red meat. And I thought it was black mold, and maybe it was, but the point is the red meat fixed that sort of weakness. And it's easier just to have good posture. Okay. Um, a week, so then a week after I started it, I was working out in my living room. Now moving into this building, took, it was a big deal, and I hadn't worked out with weights for three months. And I was feeling so good, I decided I'm going to start working out with the weights. And I got these weights in my living room. I've had them for, four, I bought the house four years ago. I've, Bought the weights at the same time. And I just look at it, and they're the kind that are adjustable. So you can add more weight with the little thing, you know, and you can add more, more plates to it. Just some dumbbells. And I'm looking at these, and I'm like, I can pick up more than that. I can pick up my normal, just looking at it, I was like, I can pick up more than my normal amount. And I did, and I broke my chest press record that day. And I hadn't worked out in three months. And um, so the following week, um, so I had a little bit of constipation from lack of vegetables, okay? And, and I hurt my back when I was lifting weights like this, and I felt this pull in my back, and I'm like, and I'm a chiropractor, and I'm like, oh my God, that's going to hurt. 
it's going to take me two weeks for this pain to go away. And that was in the morning. So I, I jump in the shower, I get in my car, I'm driving to work, I hit a bump, and the pain goes to a 9 out of 10. And I'm like, this is going to be two weeks. So anyways, three days later, my pain was 100% gone. And I did get an adjustment from Dr. Vickers that works here. I got a couple adjustments from him. But, but I learned my lesson that I still need to eat salads. And the other lesson I learned was I'm gonna, I need to eat red meat every single day. Now, before that, I was eating red meat about twice a week. And that was it. And I was under the influence that red meat is bad. Everybody thinks that red meat is bad. And I can go into why they think that way. I, and I have it in my notes here that I should do that. But, um, and I've always loved red meat. So there was a time when I ate no red meat for six months. We're talking when I just moved to Ann Arbor. So we're talking like 2000, 2001, somewhere in there. I had no red meat for six months because it's bad. And I'm walking through Kroger and they had buy one steak, get one free. I'm like, okay, I'm going to, I just, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I'll cook one tonight. I'll freeze the other one for a week later. So I cooked that one. I ate it that night. I woke up in the morning. I felt so good. I had the second steak that next day. Okay, so you get the increase in oxygen in your body from the myoglobin, an increase in iron and oxygen. It makes you breathe easier. It makes you physically stronger. And um, so I was going to get into the, carnit the carnitine. So red meat has a lot of car carnitine in it. Just think carnitine, carnivore. So what does carnitine do? So here's a cell that is filled with fat all inside the cell. And you have mitochondria. The mitochondria is where energy is made. There could be 1,500 to 3,000 mitochondria per cell, 3,500 mitochondria per cell. Carnitine takes that fat and it drives it into the mitochondria and uses it as fuel. So you could potentially eat this sort of a one-to-one -one ratio of fat versus protein plus carbs, and you're eating red meat, you can go deep in ketosis, even though the numbers, like this traditional number I've been using for three years, even though you're not meeting this, you're only doing this, but it's red meat, you can be deeper in ketosis because it's red meat. Okay. Now this ratio here, I got this from uh, Dr. Wilder from the Mayo Clinic, back when they studied ketosis extensively at the Mayo Clinic, which is 1920 through 1930. Okay, so this has been proven to work, okay? But there's an exception with the red meat. Um, so let me give you a couple other stories about experiences I had. Um, about a month ago, I went with a friend. We went, we, he's got a Jeep. We went four-wheeling over by Jackson. And I skipped breakfast. So we did this for like three, four hours. And I was the passenger, so I would get out of the Jeep, run up the hill and look for trees. So because he's like going to launch, <laughs> you know, we didn't want him to hit any trees. And uh, so it was an active morning. So then we drove home, <clears throat> and we were, we were driving through the Irish Hills, and there's a place called the Patriot Pub and Grub. Raise your hand if you know that place. It was the best ribeye steak I've ever had at a restaurant. And it was fat, and it was you know, it was thick and it was awesome. I covered it in butter and I had beef chili and I, I think I had a salad and some, some green vegetables with it. And then I didn't have dinner that night because I wasn't hungry. This was one o'clock when I had this, this steak. Before I went to bed, I tested my ketones and my blood and they were 2.4, which is, which is really high, which is a nice, heavy state of ketosis. Next morning, I didn't have breakfast. I wasn't hungry. I had an early lunch. I went 11 hour, 21 hours with no food because of that one steak at 1 o'clock. So that's intermittent fasting. Satiety is king. You have to be satisfied because you had a fatty, high, you know, like healthy protein meal and you're not thinking about food for, for hours and hours, right? You're not trying to suppress your appetite, which is the biggest scam ever put on human beings is to suppress your appetite. Um, another story, this is about three weeks ago. Sunday night I had a sirloin steak. And this is, I, I, get, I get beef from a grass, uh, uh, organic farmer in Manchester. So the, the sirloin steak is out of my freezer. And it's probably at least 20 ounces. That was Sunday night. Monday night I had the other one. 
again, probably 20 ounces or 24 ounces. And then, and then, uh, and I was using chronometer, so I was counting my calories and fat, protein, carbs. My calories on Sunday were 3,500 calories. On Monday, they were 1,500 calories. And then on Tuesday, all day Tuesday, 400 calories. So I just, you know, your calories go up and down based on what the quality of the food that you're eating. Okay, so just, you know, when you look at standard dietetics recommendations, they'll say you have to have 1,700 calories per day, whatever. That's not true. You know, you can vary it based on your activity level, how much you're, you're using your brain for with your job, with your stress level. If you break a bone, you better start eating more calories. But when you're doing this kind of eating, um, carnivore st style intermittent fasting, you know, like high protein, uh, high red meat dinners, your calories will go up and down. Okay. So now, um, okay, so I'm done with the first inch of this form. I'll fold that down. Okay. So let's talk about plants. So there's been a, a number of videos on YouTube, and, and this is based on research that's in PubMed, etc. And just the history of uh, dietetics um, recommendations. Um, there's a study done in 2012 with 63 patients. 100% of them had constipation. 100% of them had strain trying to start their bowels. 50% of them had bloating and uh, bleeding. And there was one other symptom, but there were basically there were five symptoms. And they took these 63 people and they put some of them on a high fiber diet. And those people had one bowel movement every seven days and they had an increase in their strain, in their bleeding, you know, all that. They got worse with the high fiber diet. Produce, we're talking plants and we're talking bread too. And then they had another group of people of these 63 that they did a re reduced fiber diet. They had a modest reduction in their symptoms. And then the other group of people out of that first 63 had a zero fiber diet. That group that had a zero fiber diet had no symptoms at all. All the constipation, the bleeding, the straining, the, the bloating, all of it was completely gone. Zero of them had any symptoms left. So, and they had one bowel movement per day. Okay, so we're all taught that fiber is good for constipation. Okay, now there's insoluble fiber, which means you can't digest it. And then there's soluble fiber. So you can make an argument that soluble fiber is healthier and, and you know, like it's better for most people. And like I said, like I experienced some constipation on the second week of the eating more carnivore. Okay, but in this particular study, um, I'm, just, I'm just giving you the fact that, that uh, the people that had zero fiber diet had no symptoms. Now, the insoluble fiber, what does it do? It bulks up in your colon. Okay, so if you have a traffic jam of cars on the highway and you want to solve that, what do you do? Add more cars? No, it like bulks up the, the highway. So the point here is like, um, that the fiber can actually dry things up and, and make it even more difficult. Okay, so I'm just debunking this whole aspect about fiber. There was, a, I think it was 2006, there were two really big studies that came out and they were epidemiological. One was, I think, from Dr. Burke, B-U-R-K-E. And both studies said we need X grams of fiber per day, 50 grams of fiber, 30 grams of fiber. But again, those are epidemiological studies. You can't get cause and you can barely get truth from an epidemiological study. You know what an epidemiological study is? Raise your hand if you don't know what it is or shake your head no. All right, I, let me go over into this. So epidemiology is a study of epidemics. So here's a bunch of people with bubonic plague and these people don't have it. What's the difference? What's causing bubonic plague, right? So let's translate that into modern times. Here's a bunch of people that are overweight, heart disease, um, high blood sugar, and th their lifestyle is this. 
they smoke more, they drink more alcohol, they exercise less, they never go to their doctor, they don't wear their seatbelt. They're, con they're called non-adherers. They do not adhere to what anybody tells them what to do. And guess what? They eat more meat. These people are thin, they don't have heart disease, they exercise, they see their doctor, they don't drink much alcohol, they don't smoke, and they eat beans. Okay, so is meat making these people sick? In this type of study, you can't answer that question. And 90% or 95% of all nutrition research over the last 100 years is epidemiology. You cannot find cause when you're studying big groups like this and you're looking at their lifestyle factors. Okay, so you take this group and you say, all right, looks like meat is bad. Then you do an experiment. This is called a randomized control trial or a clinical trial. And you take two groups of people, and they've done this, 17,000 women, the Women's Health Initiative, and they said to this group of people, reduce your meat intake by 20%. And they followed them for years. And the people that reduced their meat intake had the exact same rate of heart disease, diabetes, and cancer as the people that were eating the normal amount of meat. So that one study proves that all the epidemiology that says that red meat is bad is false. Because you would expect that 20%, there'd be a 20% reduction in cancer and heart disease. And, okay, so there are studies even back in the 70s and 60s in, in uh, medical wards where people were living there and it would be unethical to do this now, but they fed these people they, they took away the saturated animal fat and they gave them seed oils, cano you know, canola oil, corn oil. And so they removed these, the animal fats and their LDL went down. And they said, oh look, less heart disease and less heart attacks. But those people died quicker with cancer. So all, all cause mortality was worse or the same because they changed those fats around. So, Anyways, there's, just, there's examples of clinical trials that give us the truth, whereas most studies, when you go on YouTube and you go on social media and people post a link saying that there's an 18% increase in cancer with, when you eat meat, no, that's not true. It's just not true because it's an epidemiological study. Okay, so there's that. Um, Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run through some people that I study from and they read the research and they translate it into, um, into an easy to read uh, article. And the first one I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, Georgia Ede, Dr. Dr. Ede, E-D-E. And um, she, went through the, she went through PubMed where all the medical research is. And she, she was trying to find out what's the research that shows that plants are beneficial. She just wants to find out, show me the studies, the clinical studies that show that eating plants is good for us. So she typed it in and there were 1,281 articles. Now of that, most of them were epidemiological studies. So she threw those out. And they had food frequency questionnaires. You throw those out. So a food frequency questionnaire is this. Fill out this form, it's 10 pages long. In the last six years, tell us what you ate. And it's, the questions are like, how many cups of barbecue ribs would you eat per month? Right, like, a bar, like do you measure ribs in cups? You know, like it's just ridiculous. And so when people submit their answers back, the calories are so low or so high, it's implausible that it's even true for like a third of the responses. Okay, and then um, she, re she threw out the studies that were comparing one vegetable to another, and she threw out the studies comparing um, of plant extracts, like artemisia from wormwood, you know. And then she threw out studies that were just based on biomarkers. So does this plant affect LDL? Does this plant affect insulin? Okay, so it's more about eating vegetables and fruit, and how's your health? So we're left, so there's 400, there's 44 studies left. Seven showed that plants were beneficial to eat. One was neutral, four were mixed, and 32 showed no positive benefit to eating plants. 
32, right. Now, most of the studies were just trying to, like, trying to study how do we get more people to eat more plants. It was more like an application study, like, do you entice them with, you know, with advertising or what? So, um, <clears throat> so having said this, I sell plants in supplement forms. And they're herbs, and my favorite, one of my favorite companies is MediHerb out of Australia. All their, plant, all their supplements are all plants. They have no animal parts whatsoever. And this is a book, The Principles and Practice of Phytotherapy by Kerry Bone. He's the guy that started the company back in the 80s. So it's a thick book, and it lists all the plant chemicals and the plants and what do you use. Do you use roots? Do you use the flower? Do you, use, do you harvest it early? Do you harvest it late? You know, all that stuff. So most people are okay eating plants. And if you are, good for you. Consider yourself lucky because there are people who can't eat plants. They get a bad histamine reaction. They get cystic acne. They get rheumatoid arthritis. And that's just, a, unfortunately, the luck of the draw genetically for some people. Okay, now, for example, and my girlfriend, for example, she can't eat green peppers. She gets bloated with green peppers, but she's okay with yellow and red. So explain that. There's no explanation for that. You know, it's just avoid the green peppers. So Georgia talks about the different types of chemicals in foods that can affect people's health negatively. For example, you've heard of gluten. Everybody knows that gluten might be bad for you. But there's also um, gliadin, and there's phytates, and there's oxalates, and there's salicylates, and there's lectins. So the list can go on and on and on. And, these are, and so these, this list of, of uh, plant chemicals, I, ca I think was kind of first introduced to the broad public by a guy named Steve Gundry. He's a, he's a medical doctor. His uh, book is called The Plant Paradox. Okay. Um, so there's a guy named Gary, Dr. Gary Fetke from New Zealand. He's an sur orthopedic surgeon. He's cutting people's legs off that are diabetic. And he's like, well, what can they do with their diet so that they're you know, not diabetic, so we don't have to keep cutting their legs off? And he got in trouble because he recommended no fructose, no sugar to his patients. So were, the medical board was threatening to um, take, excuse me, take his license away. <clears throat> and they um, almost did, but he was cleared about three, four weeks ago. So he can, he can continue to practice, except there's one thing that he can't do. He can't, take, he can't make dietary recommendations for the rest of his career. Even if he's completely right and all the research backs him up, he cannot make dietary recommendations in, in the country where he practices. Okay, so, um, so another person, okay, one thing that Gary Fecky said, him and his wife have been researching the sort of like near modern information, like how do we get to the state that we are with the food that we're eating. And in 1990, there was a, advertising campaign. It had nothing to do with any government anywhere. It was a corporate advertising campaign called Five a Day. Five fruits and vegetables a day. That was 1990. Now, before that, people used to say, eat your meat and vegetables. They took the word meat out and they put in the word fruit. So five a day, fruit and vegetables. So that's just, that's, I think that was a huge, you know, like, it had a huge influence on people throughout the English-speaking world. Okay, so, and what the United States does with our government USDA food pyramid recommendations, it bleeds over into Europe and Australia and South Africa and New Zealand, and they just, they follow what we do. Okay, um, so there's another guy named Dr. John Yonides. He's a meta-researcher. So he was a math whiz in high school in Greece and he was almost a celebrity because he was so smart. Both of his parents were medical doctors. He became a medical doctor, and he's a statistician in medicine. And he's looking at all the research and how crappy it is, like I said, with the epidemiology. And he basically says that we need to throw that in the waste bin. That's his exact quote, is to throw it in the waste bin. And I say this on my social media excursions, <laughs> and people are offended by this. Like, People think we need to look at all of the, the totality of the research. No, we just want to look at the good research. 
not the epidemiological research, but John Yonides, he um, was looking at 40 foods, plants, and he's trying to determine, do these plants have an effect on cancer? Because when you read the studies, they'll say oftentimes, yeah, this plant reverses cancer. Or, you know, this, I mean, they have a claim regarding cancer for that food. And he compiled, and when you do a small trial, you can have a bigger and bigger influence. Like you'll say cabbage reverses cancer when you test it on two people. But when you test it on 2,000 people and they all have cancer and they're all eating cab two heads of cabbage every day, then, you, then you're more likely to get the truth. So the point here is that, and I don't want to get into the numbers and all that stuff, but the point here is that plants have no effect on cancer. They do not cause it. They do not cure it. And the technical term would be a relative risk. The relative risk for plants regarding cancer, I'll put RR, is 0.998. Okay, now if it was 1.0, that's absolutely neutral. It's, it's neutral. Plants are neutral regarding cancer. So there are people who do like a vegan diet and they juice for cancer. And it's a cleansing diet. It can clean your body out. Say so you can you could potentially have an effect on that, but back in January, February, I had a woman reverse her breast cancer, and I had her eating bacon and meat and fats, and I got her into ketosis. Okay, and she wasn't feeling weak while she was doing it. She wasn't losing her her uh, muscular strength. Okay, so just just another fact about like our, how how necessary are plants. Okay, so let me get more into the historical aspect of this. I just did a video on this. Um, so when you look back at our ancestors 13,000 years ago, they were hunting big animals. And they were very successful at it. As a matter of fact, over the course of 1,000 years, from 13,000 to 12,000 years ago, they hunted to extinction 30 large species of animals. 30, three zero. That include the, the giant deer. And there, I have, you, can, you can Google this and look at museum, um, you know, the skeletons, the display of the giant deer. I mean, the antlers are like 10 feet, and it looks like they're like 12 feet tall. And of course, the woolly mammoth, we all know about that. The mastodons, they were hunted to extinction by our ancestors. Three species of giant sloths, they're, they're, they're huge giant sloths. Um, species of camels, horses, um, I know I'm missing some, but there's like 30 different species. So there's two ways that they hunted. Number one, you just get a bunch of spears and some guys, and you, 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 you approach the elephant. What's the elephant going to do, run away? No, the elephant will turn and face. And you just surround it, and you stab it, and that's how you kill an elephant. The other way is to chase it down. So antelope, for example, they can run, they can run 30, 40 miles an hour or faster. And then the human will run. And then the antelope has to uh, cool down. So the animal cannot get into ketosis. If it does, that's, that's, a, that's disease for the animal. But humans can. So we have really good perseverance. We can run for eight hours. And then we don't have fur all over our bodies like the antelope. So we can cool off easier. We can sweat and cool that off. And so anyways, after six hours of chasing an antelope, now it's on the ground. It can't move anymore because it's out of breath. It's overheated. And then that one person that spent the last six hours walking and running after it just stabs it. So it's not that hard to get a large animal. And now you feed your tribe for a week. OK? So now. And I had an online debate with a professor of nutrition. And he said that hunters would often come back empty handed. And they said, OK, but they left in the morning hungry. They were probably in ketosis. And their meal the night before was probably meat. If they came back empty handed, they're deeper in ketosis. <laughs> and if they're Native American, they had a pouch with pemmican in it, which is all buffalo fat, and they ate buffalo fat and nothing but for three days while they're trying to you know, hunt, chase down a buffalo or stab a buffalo. So um, 
There's, that's how our ancestors hunted. So, and you know, like 300 years ago, or 200 years ago, you just put your, your shotgun up in the air and you pull the trigger and you get five, five birds, you know? There's an article in the Toledo Blade from the late 1800s. It was passenger pigeons. There were so many passenger pigeons flying all at once that it was a mile wide and three days long of birds. So just like that. And there were guns that were 12, 15 feet long. You'd have like two or three guys operating it. You have to hold it up, pull the trigger. You can get 20, 30, 40, 50 birds with one shot. But now we have chickens, so that's just how it goes. And I, I, I think about this, you know, you're, you're driving down the road, it's like, where's the birds? You know, where are the birds? Animal agriculture, or um, and, um, soybean monoculture is a, is a big problem with the pesticides. So I grew up on a farm just in Swanton, Ohio. And um, I started when I was nine, so we're talking, I was born in 71. So 1980, 81, 82, I was working on a farm. And there were guys there that um, would tell me some stories, but you know, there's, there's no natural lakes in all of Ohio. There's Lake Erie, and then that's it. Everything else is streams. And there are plenty of streams on our land. <clears throat> and this guy told me once that you could straddle a stream like this. We're talking back in the 60s. Your feet aren't wet. The water is between your legs. And you grab a fish and you throw it. You grab the next one and you just, that's how you fish. You just grab them and you throw it onto the land. That's how filled and stocked the streams were with fish. And, um, but then with the spraying of, of pesticides and all the chemicals and fertilizers, it killed all that and the streams were empty. And sometimes you would find like a, a big snapping turtle that was 40 years old or something like that. You know, so that's, that's that was my experience. Okay. Um, so still talking a little bit about plants. There's a guy, I, I don't know his name, on Twitter. He's a medical, no way, he's not a, he is a IT specialist on Wall Street. Super smart guy, trying to problem solve. And when he was 38, he had a TIA, which is a mini stroke. And then a few years, a few years later, he had another problem. And he's like overweight, so he decides to fix his health. So the first thing that he did was he was at like a salad bar or something. And he had a, um, a jar of, of salad dressing in his hand. And his first thought was, there's probably something in here that's bad. So he read through it, and there's canola oil. So he stopped eating canola oil. And seed oils, formerly known as vegetable oils. So corn oil, and that includes peanut oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, the vegetable oils. Those are all bad. Every single one of them is bad. Too much omega-6, not enough omega-3. And so he quit the seed oils, and he lost like 30 pounds, and has completely reversed his health back to being healthy. He did not go low carb. <laughs> he did not cut out rice and bread and pasta. He just cut out the bad oils. So most people, when they ch start to change their diet, they go low carb, which is fantastic, which is great. Okay, he didn't go low carb until later. So... Having said that, when you look at other countries, for example, India, China, 70% of their calories are from carbohydrates. Still to this day, right, decades back, all the way to, the, to today, they're eating white rice, and, but their diabetes is going through the roof. Their chronic disease rates are going super high faster than ours. Why is that? Is it because of the white rice? No, it's because of the seed oils. So they're not using pork fat like they used to in China. They're using canola oil or whatever is being sold to them. So now most people, when I talk to patients, brand new patients, whatever, they, most of them have cut out the seed oils, the vegetable oils already. They're using coconut oil, avocado oil, and olive oil. Those are the three fruit oils. Those are the good ones. <coughs> Oh my gosh, did I talk about carnivore diet yet? All right, so, so you got the message that plants aren't as important as we thought they were. And it's really strange for me to say this. 
And I'm saying this because somebody sucked me into Twitter about six months ago. And they started watching the low carb people and the keto people. And, so, and then I got involved with the carnivore people. So there's this, there's this progression from low carb to ketosis to carnivore. And it's all a big, one big happy family, to be honest. They don't fight each other. Because it depends on what your body wants, right? So some people don't like to eat red meat because it hurts their stomach, it feels heavy, their gallbladder doesn't work very well, their stomach doesn't work very well, it doesn't make enough hydrochloric acid, and that could be because of eating too much bread for too long. But um, So some of the hardcore carnivore people would be Ted Neiman, medical doctor, and then another guy named Sean Baker. So let's talk about Sean Baker. Um, he was keto for about um, two years. And he's always been athletic. And he um, was um, looking around Facebook groups and just reading what people were doing to get better. And every once in a while, somebody would say, all my arthritis is gone because I'm only eating meat. And somebody over here would say, um, all my diabetes is gone because I'm only eating meat. And he started seeing this pattern of people who are really, really healthy because they cut out everything but meat. So he decided to do this. Now it's been two years. And he's an athlete. He's got a world record in uh, a sprint um, rowing. And I think he's, 50, he's turning 52 pretty soon. But it, yeah, two years of just nothing but meat. And there's other people on Twitter that I'm following, and there's groups on Facebook that you can like, get involved with, where some people are eating nothing but meat for 10 years. 20 years. There's a guy at 22 years. And there's a guy, his nickname was The Bear. I'd have, he's on Reddit, but he's passed away from a car accident two years ago. People talk about him on Reddit. 52 years of nothing but meat. And he was a roadie for the Grateful Dead. 52 years. And he's like, you got to be disciplined. You can't cheat. And the other thing is, why would you cheat when you just ate the most valuable food you could possibly think of? It is your appetizer, it is your dessert, you know, it's the meal. Some people say, well, I had a steak last night, now I feel groggy. No, you had a steak and a dessert and a roll and bread at the beginning, and you had, you know, like it's not just the steak. You can't blame the steak for what the bread did. You can't blame the burger for what the bread did. So um, now as I, as I follow people on, on the social media, how they get involved in the carnivore diet, they start increasing their meat. Um, slowly, and they pay attention to how their body's acting, how their digestive system is acting, and what their appetite is telling them to do, what to do. And so some people eat a tremendous amount of maybe four or five pounds a day initially because they've been starving themselves of those essential nutrients, and then later their appetite comes down and they end up eating less. And um, depending on your body size and your activity level, you may need more, you may need less. Now, one thing that I'm very happy to uh, tell you about my symptoms is, and I don't have that many to begin with, but my brain works so much better and I'm more alert. And there's no, and I did have moments of like eating lunch, low carb, you know, high fat, um, moderate to high protein lunch, and then kind of like, oh, you know, like being tired like this. But when it's red meat, it's, I don't have that. So... And when you're done at work, let's say you're back at home at 6.30 or 7, you shouldn't be tired. And people say, well, I guess it's just my job. No, no, it's your diet. So you should have good energy until the, day, until the moment that you go to bed, right? Or the moment when you should be going to bed, but you're refusing to. Okay. All right, those are my notes that I wanted to go over. Ask me some questions. About the carnivore diet, yeah. Yeah. Amazing man, and uh, carnivore saved my life. So. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier, and I don't know if I just missed something in what you were saying, but so you've been carnivore for about at, at one time you were carnivore for like a couple of weeks and you were feeling. But then they added some vegetables back in, right? Yeah, so I'm still eating red meat every day, at least once a day, more, more than that. Go ahead. You said that um, you did that because you started um, experiencing constipation. Right. Okay. And um, did you... What, what is your, your thought process on the, the concept that 
on a carnivore diet, there's less waste. Right. Most of the digestion of the meat happens up here. Small intestine, stomach, gallbladder. Right. With plants, it's lower here. Right. right. More bulk, insoluble fiber. Right. Yeah. So what I've been reading is that, well, were you really experiencing constipation? Yes. Yeah. But I kept going. Yeah. And I did find out like after a few months that I had started having regular bowel Right, which I've seen many times on social media. Yeah. Where you just work through it. And I was like, well, I'm not, I'm not going to suffer. I'm just going to eat some salads. Right. And so, I mean, I don't know what the, the conditions were that really led you to, to try. Like, so for me, with the carnivore diet, what led me to it is I had severe medically diagnosed chronic Right. I tried everything. Everything right. that's out there you can try, I have tried. The juicing, the raw eating, the vegetarians, then the whatever. And then we discovered meatheals.com. Right, which is Sean Baker's. So you can submit testimonials. And I was reading through it recently. And what's, what blows my mind is the autoimmune diseases going away. Yes. Like juvenile rheumatoid arthritis somebody's had for decades. Yes. And it's, yeah. Okay. So it's, yeah. So, so for me, um, that's why I pressed on because I'm like, okay, this is working for me because I had huge, huge food intolerances to everything. So I'm one of those people that there's barely, I can maybe eat avocados and I think it's because they're very high fat. That's my guess. Yeah. Um, things like that, but I can't eat. So let me, so let me state, um, meat is hypoallergenic. Yeah. I should have said this in the first 60 seconds. So plants have a defense mechanism called poisonous chemicals. All the things I listed off, like lectins and stuff. And lectins can be, are beneficial, right, to some people. And they do things in the body that are good. But, for, but they can also wipe out the villi in your small intestine so you get leaky gut and uh, intestinal problems. But anyways, so plants punish you for eating them by making these chemicals, whereas animals, they bite you, they kick you, they run away. But once you hunt them down, their meat is hypoallergenic. Okay. So I'm just curious what, what, you know, what prevented you from going on further and not... Oh, I'm still going on. Okay. I'm still eating red meat, like, yeah. Um, and I got into it in the first place. Part of not being able to handle the constipation or whatever. Yeah. So, and I got into it in the first place because I was reading about it on on Twitter, what these, what these other doctors are doing, it's like, well, I'm going to do it because I absolutely love red meat. I always have. Okay, other questions? Yes, sir. Um, okay, I heard you say get rid of seed oils, stick with fruit oils. What about bacon grease? Yeah, bacon grease is good. Bacon grease is good. Yeah. Okay, what about and seafood? Seafood is good. Lard is good. I have a big frozen thing of, of lard from lamb in my freezer. So you cut that off, put it in the pan, heat it up. I, I just want to be <coughs> the seafood piece because you said red meat, which was lamb, beef, and... Goat and gyro, yeah. Okay, so, and, but chicken, in not so good, pork, not so good, and... No, they're still good. They're still good? Right, they don't have the myoglobin like the red meat does. Okay, and seafood, or, or the different shellfish? Yeah, it's good. I'm sorry. Right. Okay. Yeah. One thing that somebody said on social media was, and I think this was Sean Baker. Sean Baker said this, that you got the caribou in um, in Russia that were being hunted, and then they run away, and so the villagers would fish, 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 wait for the caribou to come back, and then they get the caribou. Right. The fish was not pre preferential. Okay. You had a question. So what's the lipid disorder? Familial hypercholesterolemia. Okay. And so where's the research that shows that women benefit from statin drugs? There's none. Where's the research that shows that familial hypercholesterolemia leads to um, increased myocardial inf infarction past the age of 
80. There's none. So how long do your people live? Into their late 90s. Okay, so you're fine. You don't need the medications. Do they live in their late 90s? They have high cholesterol? Not a deal. It's not a thing. It's not, yeah, it's not even a problem. Not a problem. So LDL does not cause heart disease. Remember this. LDL, when you, when you get into ketosis, the first thing that drops down is triglycerides. That is the fuel that your muscles are now using because, let me back up a little bit on this concept here. It's really interesting. You know what, Kelly, can you turn that, that dehumidifier off? <clears throat> So your body digests alcohol first, then it digests carbs. Oh my gosh, I can't believe how loud that was. <laughs> and then it digests fats, and then it digests protein in this order. It does this, then this, then this. It doesn't do all four at the same time. So when you drink a beer, eat a burger with, bun, with a bun and the french fries, you're eating all four, right? So this goes away first, and this goes away. And now, how, let's say that it takes six hours for this to go away, but you have a snack before bed. Then you wake up and you have cereal for breakfast. This never goes away in the standard American diet. Okay, but once this is gone and this is gone, now you can go into ketosis and then you start to, your body now can address the fats. So the first thing that goes down is triglycerides, which is the fuel that your muscles use, and it's carried by LDL. This is the bus that carries the fuel. For some people, their LDL goes up. Totally fine. But what the people who don't understand say is that because the placking has LDL in it, therefore LDL causes the placking. It's like saying, every time I drive by a house fire, there's always firemen. They must be causing the house fires. That's not it. <laughs> Yeah, so cause correlation. There's another one they're trying to pin. I'm talking about the vegans. There's another chemical called TMAO, which is in the placking. And they say, oh, TMAO, we need to lower it. No, no, just because it's in there. So what's the cause of the placking in the heart disease? It's insulin. What causes insulin to go up? It's the carbs, right? So it always goes back to that. It always goes back to the not natural state of our current food supply. So um, there's a debate, Dr. Joel Kahn, vegan uh, cardiologist from Bloomfield versus an acupuncturist named Chris Kresser on Joel Rogan. Raise your hand if you know about this debate. Yeah. Yeah. So did you see the part where Joe Rogan and Chris Kresser were making fun of Joel Kahn? Because yes. Kahn's talking about, yeah, it's just, but um, where are they going with this? TMAO. Oh, Kahn said, that the first, uh, the first time the word myocardial infarction appeared in the medical literature was 1916. True statement. And I have an article from 1912, I believe, describing the symptoms of a heart attack and you know, the, what people are experiencing when they have heart disease. So before that, heart disease was not significant enough to be in any medical literature going back to the early 1800s hardly existed. Okay, so if heart disease started in 1912, 1916, what happened 20 years earlier or 30 years earlier? Sugar, sugar the industrialized uh, sugar, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Verner's, Tootsie Rolls. It's just, it's, it's so date coincident, like it's so obvious. It wasn't the invention of meat. It wasn't the invention of butter. That goes back to the dawn of time. You know, like this, it's so simple to see that heart disease is not caused by meat or animal products or dairy. It's caused by sugar. So you can eat the meat and, you know, the fat, but you got to keep the sugar down. Or to be honest, you can flip it. You can have high carb eating and be a vegan and keep your fat all the way down. And you can, you know, prevent heart disease that way too, to be honest. They both work. But once you combine both the fat and the sugar together, the sugar destroys the fat. The fat becomes a cluster bomb that circulates around in your body causing harm everywhere. Okay, so it's the sugar destroying the fat and the fat destroys your body. You had a question? Yes, um, if I'm trying to eat meat and the antifungal, and I have a heart attack, does that mean I'm going to fall into ketosis 
No, not necessarily, no. Okay. All right, other questions? Huh? Huh? No, you're doing good. Yeah, right. Okay, other questions on carnivore? Yeah. What happens if you don't? Yeah, yeah, you. Oh, Go ahead. Sorry. What happens if you don't? Don't have a gallbladder. So if you don't have a gallbladder, you want to um, experiment with bile salts and ox bile. So sometimes you've, you'll find a supplement with both. We have both individually we got the bile salts and we have the ox bile sometimes people just need one or the other sometimes people need both so that's the stuff that will digest the fat okay. that your gallbladder is okay yeah i don't have a gallbladder and i eat lots of fat okay good yeah i've seen that plenty of times that's good and i do have to say regarding my own situation eating more meat i was like burping more so i take hydrochloric acid oh, okay. to help the stomach and that helps, that's been helping tremendously. Yes, and I've been, I've been experimenting with that as well. Yeah. But I do find, though, that if, when I eat meat, the more fat I eat, the better the digestion. And the right. Fat. So traditionally, our ancestors would kill an animal, eat the muscle meat, and then eat the fatty parts, mm -hmm. the fat on the back, mm -hmm. the adrenal glands, the brain, the bone marrow. So there are separate dishes. Now we have the fat and the meat and the protein together with the, with, well, with grass fed, or with grain fed cows. Okay. And the other thing I want to say is like regarding the hydrochloric acid I'm taking, I'm planning on getting off of it. And one of the original problems was the mold in the other office. I'm breathing it in. It's hurting here. I'm swallowing it. It's in the air. And then I'm burping because it's creating, you know, dysfunctional microbiome here in my gut. So I'm still trying to, rec I'm still recovering from that, but there's a little side note on that. Okay, questions? Yeah? So when we start eating red meat, I assume we have to stick with uh, grass-fed organic, right? Yeah, and it's very important to do grass-fed organic because of the omega-6, omega-3 ratio. So we got, I'm just put like omega-6 versus omega-3. And the ratio, ideally in your body, this can be tested with a blood test. Ideally, you're at one to one, or maybe at the most, the three, three to one. That'd be good. But there are people who, they're eating KFC, you know, the really horrible oils in large quantities. They're, they're 40 to one. And you, you can fix that in six months to a year by eliminating all the seed oils and taking in some omega-3, extra omega-3 fish oils or algae, and then eating grass-fed meat. So yeah, you can reverse that. So, and this is a big deal. This is a big deal for neurological problems, autism, Alzheimer's, you know, that kind of stuff. You want this ratio to be right. Thank you. Yeah. Is grape, is grape seed oil one of the seed oils you say to stay away from? Yeah, stay away from that. Yeah. Yeah. I heard you say earlier that uh, eating meat helps you breathe. And I've got COPD, so would move, moving more towards uh, a carnivore diet help me? P potentially. So here's the deal with, when I say increasing the red meat increases the myoglobin and hemoglobin, more oxygen in your blood. So I'm not saying that it'll help repair your lungs, like to increase the oxygen carrying capacity of the, of the lungs. But, you know, eating more meat like that could reduce inflammation and help heal, potentially. Okay. Okay. Good question. Yeah. Another question? Yeah. It's hard to find good steaks with fat because they cut all the fat off. Ribeye. Ribeye. Right. Ribeye. <laughs> and you pick and pick your favorite cut of meat too. So some people prefer sirloin or other people prefer the fillet which has less you know like less uh, ringing of meat if you will. But and then when you look at the, the ground beef, there's like 80-20 and there's 90-10. And, and experiment with that and see what your body likes the most of. But that's a, that's a very good point. Yeah. And also, I love pork belly. Yeah. And I don't know if that's really good for you or not. Yeah, it's all good for you. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. So I was at a restaurant this past weekend. I was in Chicago area. And it was a steakhouse. 
and I ordered a steak and I told the guy, and I, I've, I've learned how to ask for butter. You go like this. You say, I need a bowl of butter. And you, and you do, you look him in the eye, right, the waiter, with intention. I need a bowl of butter, like that. So the guy came out with a bowl of butter, and it was this big, and it was filled up, and I just took it and I dumped it on my steak. And that had some green, green beans next to it and ate it all up. And at the end, I said, D have you ever had anybody eat a bowl of butter? He said, no, I've been here six years. I've never seen it before in my life. <laughs> so I've been at restaurants where I'm like, I need more butter, butter. And they come out with a little cup. You know, it's all cute. And I'm like, no, I need like 10 of these. And they're like, 10 of them? Yeah, like, a, like this much. So, and then the, guy had, the waiter had said, we should charge you for that. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you probably should charge that's where the value is. Yeah, go ahead. Right, and I'm always asking. And you know, this brings up a point. I was going to do a video on this. All restaurants suck. Yes. Because they fry their whatever in canola oil. And so in, there's that Grange restaurant, downtown Ann Arbor, from farm to plate. Grange, raise your hand if you've been there. Yeah. So they serve, uh, you know, the meat platter at the beginning, like an appetizer. They shave fat off the back of the pig, and they put the shavings down next to the other cuts of, of salami and stuff. It's absolutely fantastic, right? But I was talking with a friend of mine, and he was there, and he's all into what I talk about. He asked them, because they have duck fat fries, right? He asked them about it. They fry it in canola oil. And then they go like this with a brush and they put duck fat on top of it. So it's very misleading. And I, I have a friend, so back in whatever decade it was, in the 80s or maybe earlier, he worked at Long John Silver's where they fry fish. And he told me they would take a big chunk of lard and they would stick it in the bowl and turn on the heat and they'd have to wait, whatever, 20, 30 minutes for it to melt. That's food right there. The lard is nutritious and good for you, but then they bread it. You know, the, now you're adding the carbs and the fat together, so that's not good. So they, they've eliminated the, the real food from all the restaurants, and they put in the seed oils, and they manipulate the seed oils with chemicals, and they make it more stable. Now it'll last a week. And then the, there's a new thing where the restaurant workers say they have their uniforms, and the uniforms are in a big truck to be serviced, to be laundered, right? These, these are vol some of these are very volatile, these oils. And these clothes are saturated with volatile oils. The trucks have exploded. There's like a fire in the back of the truck. Suddenly, just, they just light on fire because of the volatile seed oils. So that's a problem. So, <laughs> so, so I want to like strong arm the restaurants to being good for us. So like... Is there a restaurant that actually uses real <coughs> fat to fry their food in, or real butter? And you can always ask for real butter if you're getting eggs or something like that. But like, I'm, that's my new thing. When I'm at a restaurant, what do, you, what do you use to fry? Can you use butter like that? Or maybe I can bring my own lard, sure. use this, and bring back a bowl of butter. I'll give you this. You give me the butter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So if you, look at these carry bowls. Yeah, if you want like a, a bowl of coffee or something yeah. like that, uh, and you can just ask them for them, they'll give you a, I mean, a little package as a carry bowl. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They, I mean, they don't charge you guys for a port either. You know, I'll say, like, give me six. Kelly, yeah. can you give me the multi glandular out of one of my rooms? Yeah. The, the, the bottle, the red bottle. It's in one of my rooms. Yeah, question? We were in our, this is more FYI, we were in Arbor Farms before we came here, and I know, and uh, Lynn pointed out to me, I saw a, a big jar of duck fat and a big jar of pork fat, and that's the first time I've ever been in the store that had animal fat. That's nice. That's good. Okay, now part of the, I, sh I, I can't not say this, but part of the carnivore diet, if you choose, is eating animal glands. So our ancestors would or would not eat the, eat the thyroid, the kidneys, the adrenals, the lungs, the brain, the liver, 
So there's a guy, uh, Wilhelm Stephenson. He, for about eight seasons, er, in the early 1900s, spent years in the, Antarct in the Arctic, north. And he, he was looking for land. He was looking for new islands, and they, he found a big land mass, and they named it after him. And he was with the Eskimo, and they were just astonished that he would go walking far away. Shotguns, he had guys, and they would shoot a seal, and per bullet, they would have 100 pounds of meat. And they ate 90% seal, 10% polar bear. They never ate the glands, and neither did the Eskimo. And they only, eat, they only ate the, the muscle meat. That was it. But there's other cultures that would eat the glands because they preferred it. And they would feed the muscle meat to the, to the dogs or whatever. So I actually made this product. This is the multi-glandular. It came out three weeks ago. It took me and a friend of mine a year to figure out what we're going to do. We came up with this. This has nine glands in it. These are just dried glands. <clears throat> they have the hormones that occur naturally with the glands. <clears throat> this is the most powerful product I've ever worked with in my whole career. So after about two weeks on this, my heart started going boom, 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 a little bit harder. My blood pressure was a little bit up. I was doing four a day for two weeks. It's too much. And my friend that helped me on this, he's a triathlete. So his workouts are so much more powerful. He's got so much more energy. He also felt the blood pressure coming up a little bit. So we reduced the dosage down. I think he's taking two a day. And I'm gonna, when I start back up on, it's going to be one a day. But there are, I do have people on three or four a day, and they're chronically sick and physically weak, and they're taking that higher dosage, and they feel stronger. Okay, now you can't, here's the deal with this. You can't take this every day for a year, because your body will get used to taking hormones in, right, exogenous hormones. Whereas, and our ancestors would eat the organs, but not every day of the year. And, you know, like, and there's pituitary in here, and there's things that they wouldn't necessarily go after because they're deep in the brain. They'd have to break the skull open and stuff like that. So, it de so um, anyways, I'm just introducing this. And, um, and it's very nourishing. And it, I'm trying to mimic the diet our ancestors had. And you can consume this and not eat liver raw and not try to find a thymus gland and the spleen and the pancreas and the kidney, you know, like you, you don't have to go searching for this in the woods or at a grocery store. It's right here. Okay. Yeah. You had a question? And that? No. No. Okay. All right. So there's that intro on this one, the multi -glandular. Yeah. For 30 days. Yeah. Okay, good. <clears throat> yeah. Why wouldn't you? I mean, do you have to have some kind of illness or, or you just you use that or like a multivitamin? Yeah, you can use this as a multivitamin. There's the concept of multivitamin, multimineral, multi enzyme, multi glandular. Instead of? Instead of eating liver raw. Yeah, and this is going to be filled with minerals. No, you'd still want to take whatever multi that you like to take. Yeah. It could be. It could be. Yeah, not, in, not necessarily in place of whatever else you're taking. Multi vitamin, multi mineral. And it's called multi glandular. And this is, well, yeah, what? Yeah, I muscle test people for this, right. And this is mimicking what our the endocrinology used to be, the father of endocrinology, Dr. Henry Harrower. He used glands like this, and he has a whole formulary, which I have all the recipes. And my idea is to recreate his, uh, his original product line that he sold to a pharmaceutical company in 1940. And then after World War II, all that kind of went away. They had discovered insulin, and they made other hormones. And they got rid of the, the pure glands. Okay, so I could go on. It's 8.17. I'll let you guys go. <laughs> so um, let me close off by saying if you're not a patient and you want to be, you can talk to Callie. And we have, we have the little tickets, right? Not the little tickets, but the bigger tickets that you can hand out to people. And you can actually book some appointments outside now at the front desk.
Yeah, and then there's a survey, and I'd appreciate that if you fill it out, and you, I'll read through it and take that into consideration, whatever, whatever you have to say. Good? Okay, good. All right, thank you.